Well, good morning, everyone. So first of all, thank you, James, and to the Kids Brain Health Network for uh, this incredible honor. Uh, Fraser Mustard is a real legendary figure uh, in the field of child development, and um, uh, it's a real honor and a privilege to have received this, uh, this award uh, named after him. Also, James, thank you so much for pronouncing the title of my professorship correctly. The last time someone introduced me, they referred to me as the perishing professor of global health, <laughs> which wasn't very reassuring. So um, let, me, let me start with this grumpy man. Um, the, the childhood origins of mental health problems have been recognized for literally thousands of years, but this grumpy man really was the first scientist in many ways to, to capture this through his observations of the patients he was seeing in his clinic in Vienna. Of course, this is Sigmund Freud, uh, and what Sigmund Freud unfortunately was handicapped with at the time that he made these observations was a complete lack of any understanding of developmental science. So he basically went on to concoct uh, a theory uh, on why childhood experiences led to mental health problems sometimes 20 years later. Uh, of course, the theory hasn't stood the test of time, but the observation, and honestly, I believe that this is perhaps the single most important observation Freud made, uh, I consider the Newtonian moment in the field of development and mental health, was that things that happen in the earliest years of your life mysteriously seem to influence your adaptation to life 20 years later. Of course, today we have a profound body of developmental science that helps us understand the mechanisms of this observation. And in a nutshell, this one slide captures it all. Early windows of experience, environmental influences, of course, is what I'm referring to here. In the first two decades of life, influence our mental health across our entire lifespan. Now, it's important for me to say that for a long time, that early window of experience was seen to be focused primarily on the first thousand days of life. But more recently, in the last two or three decades, developmental science has demonstrated that there is a very different critical developmental phase of life in that early phase, which is, of course, during adolescence. During the first thousand days, we now have a very large body of evidence that demonstrates clearly the mechanisms through which adversities in early childhood neglect more broadly influences the plastic brain, first of all, by interfering with the essential interactions that every child needs with a responsive and caring parent that builds the architecture of the brain, but equally that in these very neglectful environments, the child is exposed to chronic extreme stress that disrupts the developing neural circuits. This is, of course, why everyone in this audience would not be surprised by this particular infographic produced by the CDC that demonstrates not only the strong association between a very wide range of adversities in early childhood, but also a dose-response relationship which clearly indicates causality. These relationships are not only relevant to mental health, but the CDC estimates in this particular model that prevention of these adversities in early childhood could also have profound influences on a range of other cardiometabolic conditions. We now know, of course, that what adversities are really predicting are risky behaviors, and those risky behaviors can affect a range of different clinical outcomes. But it isn't just the first 1,000 or 2,000 days of life that are important. A very important discovery over the last three, year, uh, three decades has been the observation that most mental health problems, the, the kind of clinical phenotypes that we observe in, in practice, emerge during this 10-year phase of life between puberty and the early 20s. This large meta-analysis looked at all epidemiological studies uh, examining the age of onset of mental health problems and observed that fully 50% of the entire burden of mental health problems in the population has already emerged by the age of 14, and about two-thirds of that burden has emerged by the age of 22. This is a dramatic difference from other non-communicable diseases that typically emerge much later in life. And of course, this early emergence is what uh, is a primary reason for the large global burden of mental health problems. They start early in life and they often accompany you through much of your life's journey. So the key question is, why 
does this happen during this, this, this incredibly sensitive phase of life? And it would be fair to say that the developmental understandings of the origins of mental health problems have only emerged, I would say, in the last two decades. In the next two cartoon slides, I simply show you again a very summary uh, uh, explanation of that developmental science. This is, of course, in part to do with the plastic brain, but it is also to do with something very peculiar and important that happens only in this phase of life, which is the differential maturation of different brain regions. On this slide, we can see that the brain regions deep inside our cerebral cortex, the limbic areas that are critical for the mediation of what some scientists call hot emotions, so you can understand why uh, in this age group, emotions like rage, fear, lust, and joy, this part of the brain matures, as it turns out, around puberty, on the years immediately after puberty. But the part of the brain that's immediately behind our foreheads, the prefrontal parts of the cerebral cortex, that are essentially the higher executive decision-making centers of our brain, matures, it turns out, about eight to 10 years later. You remember, uh, I'm sure you, many of you remember those cartoons that I used to watch when I was a kid, uh, in those cartoon characters, you know, someone like Bugs Bunny or, or someone would be faced with a choice. There would be a choice that was really sexy and fun, uh, but also very dangerous. And then there was the kind of angelic choice, and you would have the devil on the one side, and you'd have the angel on the other. And of course, all of us who are of my age would remember these kinds of cartoons. They were pr very accurate predictions uh, of actually what developmental science has thrown up uh, as what happens in young people's minds all the, all the time when they're faced with decisions. It turns out, therefore, that young people are biologically and indeed evolutionarily primed to act impulsively to take risks. Because through risk-taking, the young brain prepares itself for adulthoods. This is, in fact, a huge survival advantage. But on the other hand, such risk-taking in the context of social change and adversities in one's social environment can also lead to negative behavioral outcomes. A large body of work has begun to document um, a large body of work has begun to document the kinds of adversities and social change uh, that create negative risk behavior patterns. Of course, the very dramatic life transitions that you make in these 10 years, I mean, these are the most amazing life transitions we will ever make in any 10-year period of our life. We move from being completely dependent on our parents to being completely independent and indeed having potentially children who look up for you uh, for security and safety. No other 10-year phase in your life will involve such dramatic transitions. The falling age of puberty, bullying and violence, the digital world, complex set of mechanisms that both promote but also enhance the, uh, the risks for mental health, substance use, and a range of very oppressive social, cultural, and economic circumstances all collide to lead to an increased risk of the emergence of mental health problems in this age group, and of course this is the primary reason why in the last two years, contrary to what we were initially warned, it was the elderly who were isolated who would have the greatest risk to their mental health. It turns out it's exactly the opposite. In every society around the world, it's the young in the age groups of around 14 to 30 who have been the hardest hit by the pandemic in terms of their mental health consequences. So let me now turn to what the implications of this incredible body of developmental science is on guiding our thinking about prevention. Remember, in the mental health space, we've often thought there's nothing we can do for prevention. I think that's completely wrong. This developmental science, in my mind, is the equivalent of tobacco to heart disease and cancer. We know what we should do. The solutions are complex. They're not as straightforward as telling people to stop smoking. They involve a whole of society action to target the environments that we know damage the developing brain. And of course, those environments will change as a human being moves from childhood when they're completely dependent on the home environment to school and ultimately into interacting with their peers in neighborhoods and increasingly in the digital world. Over the last 10 years, uh, thanks to the Disease Control Priorities Program, which was led by the World Bank, I was privileged to lead a group of scientists examining the evidence on interventions that could target these environments. And we published our findings as part of the Disease Control Priorities Project. This included all 
brain and mind conditions, neurological disorders, substance use disorders, as well as mental health conditions, and using an ecological framework, identified these interventions that had the strongest evidence uh, for scaling up. At home, parenting interventions that promote responsive uh, parenting. In educational institutions, interventions that do a number of things, teach young people uh, the competencies that, uh, that strengthen their problem-solving capabilities and therefore reduce harmful risk-taking, promoting a healthy social environment, that, which many social scientists refer to as social or school climate, and improving access to first-level mental health care within educational institutions in the form of indicated prevention. And of course, whole of society interventions, such as conditional or unconditional cash transfers and challenging discrimination against uh, uh, marginalized groups. All of these have robust evidence backing them, and when seen together, can hopefully profoundly shift the needle on what's been one of the most intractable health challenges that every country is facing, the seemingly unending crisis of mental health problems in our populations. I want to end by just giving you three brief examples of actual programs uh, being delivered in a low resource setting. I work, uh, I've been working my whole life in India uh, with a non-governmental organization called Sangat that works very closely with ministries of health. And I want to end by just showing you three examples of how these somewhat complex ideas can be converted into practical implementations at the coalface. Let me start with parenting interventions. There's a, such a large body of evidence, it is not my intention to tell you about the components of parenting interventions. All of you will be familiar with this, but at the heart of this, this theoretical framework of parenting interventions is responsive caregiving. There's a, there's a very well-known uh, recent publication called the Nurturing Care Framework that captures this very well. But how do we translate this in, into real-world action? So over the last couple of years, my colleagues have been working with the government of Telangana, a state in southern India, uh, to design and implement Alana Palana, which is the local language name for this program, that incorporates childhood nutrition interventions, which are a major national priority in India, but now incorporates responsive parenting uh, to target child development. The message is that these frontline workers, who are essentially the workers, the teachers in the preschool creches uh, run by the government, are taught a range of messages around play, stimulation, and parent-child interaction. They then use videos to work with groups of mothers to actually discuss, to first of all display these behaviors, to discuss challenges in how these behaviors uh, can be implemented in the household, and then there's a whole bunch of, of activities to evaluate the impact. I want to show you a brief 30-second video that just shows you one of those videos. And I hope this is going to work. There is English subtitles. There is Walu Yedutunapuru, Varu Sertal and Gurtinchi, Varu Santanga, Sertal and Chase to Untaru. Ivani, Miru Vintu, Alanti Sertal and Mandi Chayet and Dwara, Tali Vidalamacha, Samhashana Mudalotindi, Anduke, Pilalano, Vari Peruto Pilavandi, Kanaya, Chini Kanaya, Ila Chayet and Valana, Mi Bidaku, Hadrata Bhavan Kalipi. And these, these, uh, these videos are, are uh, in India, it's a very uh, long-standing tradition for mothers of young children to come together in these groups for a variety of health promotion activities. So this very established platform within these creches, uh, these preschool creches. So this, this idea of group learning is central already to a number of child health promotion programs. So this has been used as the platform to integrate and embed developmental interventions. Typically, this is done in a group format, so there's also shared learning between the mothers, but also, of course, we do recognize there are certain mothers who have additional needs who are particularly disadvantaged in one way or the other, and so there's also the prospect of individual uh, interventions with those mothers. I'll show you another brief video that demonstrates actually the implementation uh, of this group and video-based learning uh, with, with a group of mothers. 
Of course, this program is built on a very large body of developmental science, and what we're evaluating right now are essentially the implementation indicators uh, associated with the program. So that's an example of the very first of those small ecological circles I showed you, which was about parenting interventions. Let me move to the second one, which is working in educational institutions. And I want to give you two examples, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish. In educational institutions, a lot of the focus uh, uh, has been really largely around, uh, historically, has been largely around whole school interventions. There's now been a, a, another trend of directly intervening with young people uh, to build their own social and emotional competencies. And the two examples I'll give you illustrate both of these different strategies. I've been working in schools for pretty much my entire uh, academic career, uh, really trying to understand the school as a complex social system uh, and, and figuring out how we can achieve the goal of strengthening the school climate or improving the social environment to address the risk factors, but also to strengthen the protective factors uh, that can help build resilience and help prevent mental health problems. And over these last 20 odd years, I have learned a lot by co-producing interventions with teachers and with students. The culmination of that work was the design of this intervention that had a very clear theory of change that involved uh, a key set of skill building activities in young people to promote their agency. And this is very critical, again, a very abstract and opaque idea for many of us, but one can operationalize this. How do you build the agency of adolescents to actually take control of their school environment by identifying the things that they want to see changed, by empowering them to act to actually make those changes, and most importantly then by empowering them to evaluate and do course correction uh, when those interventions are being implemented. This intervention uh, was designed and ultimately implemented in the state of Bihar, which is one of the poorest states in the country. Uh, just to give you a sense of the kinds of schools we were working in, these were schools with approximately 1,000 to 2,000 students, usually between five to six teachers uh, in this secondary school for all these 1,000 to 2,000 students. Most of these children were the first in their families to go to school. Uh, the overwhelming majority of them had never seen a digital device, uh, and most of their parents were, uh, were essentially day wage laborers on, on, on uh, agricultural laborers. So this was amongst the poorest kids that you will ever encounter anywhere on this planet. And what we did was, uh, uh, it was an ambitious idea that we really wanted to promote the agency of these young people to in fact take control of the school in a highly structured hierarchical environment. Uh, this involved of course a lot of active engagement of the school administration, the teachers, to give up some of the power that they had historically been vested in. And then to implement the intervention, we designed this with two different delivery models. One was the school teacher, the government wanted that as their model because of course it involved no additional investment. But the other was to actually get a peer from the local rural communities to be recruited by the school and to act as a kind of a facilitator, an intermediary between the students and uh, the rest of the school uh, management. I don't have time to actually describe the rich amount of uh, experience that we collected in, in this uh, large trial, but simply to tell you that the findings have been published in The Lancet and in uh, PLOS Medicine. This was one of the largest uh, whole school interventions. Uh, we ran a large randomized control trial, uh, and we demonstrated not only that there were profound reductions in interpersonal violence and large improvements in mental health at the population level of the entire school population. This was a cohort of 14,000 students. But there was also a dose-response relationship. The longer the program ran, the greater was the effect, clearly indicating not just a causal influence, but the power of sustaining an intervention of this kind. But what was also interesting was that it only worked if there was an external facilitator, not through the teacher. Uh, and this demonstrates that these complex interventions involve typically an interaction between the content of the intervention 
and the delivery agent. The delivery agent is critical. And the final uh, example I want to leave you with is, the, again, one of the educational institution evidence-based strategies, which is uh, the intervention that is seeking to build social and emotional competencies. There are many different techniques that people have used. For example, mindfulness has been one that has been used in Britain. Unfortunately, recently, the large myriad trial showed a null effect, but nonetheless, that is science. We learn a lot from these null effects. But the, but the intervention, the technique we chose was problem solving. This is a very well-recognized technique. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this technique. It comes from the stable of cognitive behavioral theory and science. It's developmentally appropriate and is actually very acceptable to young people whose primary concern isn't their symptoms, but the kinds of problems they face. And resolution of those problems is very important. But from a developmental perspective, what teaching problem solving does is it helps postpone impulsive risk-taking behavior. Typically, you are conceptualizing this as the first step in a step care architecture uh, towards uh, promoting uh, mental health and early intervention. Over the last seven years, with support from the Wellcome Trust, we first of all designed this transdiagnostic intervention, co-producing it with young people. We designed and evaluated an intervention to raise awareness about the opportunities this intervention offered and increasing demand, showing a seven-fold increase in demand through a single classroom intervention. We ran a randomized controlled trial demonstrating the short-term effects of this four-session intervention, and then another follow-up showing how not only did the skills improve mental health in the short term, but there was actually a sustained and increasing effect, of course, sitting with the theory that when you teach people how to manage their mental health, it's far better than simply treating their mental health problems. You can actually generalize those skills across your life. And more recently, we have examined how we can adapt this intervention for delivery on a digital app so we can increase the coverage. Another short video, and that's it, uh, showing you how this intervention rolled out in the urban poor areas of New Delhi.
टाइम टेबल बनाता ना उसके हिसाब से चल रहा हूँ तो गर्मी सही है और पढ़ाई भी सही है मेरी प्रॉब्लम तो गुस्सा और वो कंट्रोल हो चुका है So to conclude, I think this is not an audience that will be surprised to hear this first message. Uh, nevertheless, it bears worth repeating. The brain is a work in progress, not only in the first thousand days of life, but I would hope even at my age. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I often tell my, uh, uh, you know, my students and say, you know, how does speech therapy work after you have a stroke? The brain is a work in progress right through our life course. But it would be fair to say that mostly so, the first two decades of life offer a unique opportunity for us to change the trajectory of the well-being of our entire population by targeting environmental mechanisms. I believe that a package of interventions, not just each in isolation as often happens in science, but actually glued together at a population level, harnessing the resources that every community has, people who care for each other, by demedicalizing and democratizing the skills that you can see. None of the things that you've observed here require an MD or a PhD. Can indeed profoundly mitigate the risk associated with these adversities and transform the capabilities of our population. In closing, the developmental ingredients of prevention then are a life course approach from conception to young adulthood, an equity focused population approach that recognizes that risks are disproportionately distributed in the population, and finally, an approach that is community facing, that harnesses the resources of our communities for the delivery of these interventions. Thank you very much, and I just want to acknowledge the amazing teams that I am privileged to work with in India that make all of this science happen. Thank you. Thank you.